In order to determine the airflow requirements for a displacement system, we need to look at all of the loads in the room and then determine how much of each load will reach the occupied zone. RP949 provides the weighting factors that should be used. It's important to understand that loads both inside and outside the occupied zone will have differing effects on the comfort of an occupant. ASHRAE guidelines allow us to accurately estimate these effects. The total heat transfer to the area of interest, in our case the zone between the head and foot of the occupant, can now be calculated using this equation. We can simplify things a little by taking out the air volume component to get an equation that describes the resulting temperature differential from the head to the foot of an occupant. Now it's time to look at thermal comfort considerations. ASHRAE standard 55 is often referred to as the thermal comfort standard. It recommends that for good thermal comfort, the temperature difference between the head and foot level of a standing person should not exceed 5.4 degrees. If we assume a constant floor to ceiling stratification gradient of no more than one degree per foot, any design that provides comfort for a standing occupant should also work for a seated occupant because a seated occupant would experience no more than a 3.6 degree differential. In addition, we need to pay attention to the difference between the supply and exhaust temperatures. As a rule of thumb, exhaust temperatures should not be more than 36 degrees higher than the supplier temperatures to avoid a sensation of draftiness. Now obviously, at no more than one degree per foot, it would take an extremely high ceiling to get close to a 36 degree temperature differential. We can also rearrange the equation to solve for the air change rate. If we know the air change rate, then it's a simple matter to calculate the air volume. Then rearranging the equation again, we finally have an equation to calculate the cooling volume requirement. But we're not quite done yet. If we make a few assumptions that would be appropriate for a typical office environment, we can further simplify the equation. At last we have a simple equation that we can use to calculate cooling airflow volume to handle the effect of the total heat load on the occupied zone. Now we'll step away from the math and look at both the advantages and limitations of displacement ventilation systems. So exactly what are the advantages of displacement ventilation? Well, as we'll explain, there are several ways that displacement provides both energy savings and improved air quality for our occupants. Building owners pay higher electric bills for excess system pressure, so anything we can do to lower pressure requirements will save energy while reducing operating costs. There's a calculating tool called the cost of pressure that can be found on the front page of our website. It provides a simple way to compare the operating costs of air devices operating at different pressures on an annual basis. Although the cost may first appear small, it's important to take into account the number of air delivery devices found in typical buildings. When you start multiplying the results by hundreds or thousands of units, the numbers start getting very significant. The good news is that displacement diffusers tend to have lower operating pressure than conventional overhead diffusers, so this will help to reduce our fan energy. As you can see, when comparing the annual operating costs of our most popular ceiling diffusers to a typical displacement diffuser, the winner is clear. Operating costs could be reduced by more than 70% in comparison to a typical perforated ceiling diffuser. Now remember, this savings only applies to the diffuser operating cost, which is a fraction of the total fan energy. Displacement ventilation is known to be a way to increase comfort through improved ventilation. The goal of any air distribution system should be to efficiently deliver ventilation air to the breathing zone. For this reason, ASHRAE standard 62.1 rates various types of systems with regard to air change effectiveness. These ratings take into account the supply and return locations as well as the discharge pattern and temperature. According to this standard, the very best overhead systems qualify for a rating of 1 and other lesser systems could be as low as 0.5. On the other hand, displacement qualifies for the highest possible rating of 1.2. This means that displacement ventilation is thought to be 20% more effective than the best overhead system and the minimum fresh air requirement can therefore be reduced by nearly 17%.
Displacement ventilation can be thought of as a single pass system. Unlike a mixed air system that tends to distribute contaminants more or less evenly throughout the entire room, displacement uses natural buoyancy to collect pollutants at the ceiling where they can exit the room. This action results in lower concentrations in the occupied zone. In areas with mild temperatures and low humidity, economizers make use of outdoor air to reduce operating costs while improving indoor air quality. The higher supply temperatures associated with displacement could have a major impact depending on where your building is located. As most of you know, you can't simply buy a product and get a lead credit. Lead credits are earned by increasing the sustainability of a building through the proper use of products and technology. The sort of prerequisites and credits that a properly designed, installed, and commissioned displacement system could earn would fall under the categories of energy and atmosphere and indoor environmental quality. So we've covered the advantages, but now we have to look at the limitations. From their design, it's easy to see why displacement diffusers are not generally suitable for heating applications. Slow moving hot air would simply rise straight to the return without providing any circulation in the room. There is, however, an interesting solution to this problem, and we'll get to it shortly. Displacement ventilation also has its limits with regard to room loads. As a general rule of thumb, it's not suitable for loads greater than 30 BTUs per hour per square foot. We also know that displacement ventilation doesn't work well with low ceilings or anything that could obstruct the flow of air across the floor. There's also a very important issue we need to cover in detail, and that's called the adjacent zone. Since displacement ventilation delivers cool air directly to the occupied zone, we must be very careful not to create discomfort for our occupants. The area directly in front of a displacement outlet is known as the adjacent zone. This is defined as any area in the occupied zone where air velocities exceed 50 feet per minute at a height one inch above the floor. Although these areas are perfectly suitable for use as aisles or corridors, stationary occupants should never be located within the adjacent zone. While it's highly unlikely that a person passing through or stopping for a moment would notice anything, a person seated for a longer length of time would likely feel a chill in the ankle region. In order to position outlets such that we avoid stationary occupants, we need to look at the published performance data. Titus follows the industry standard by providing the length and width of the adjacent zone for both a 5 degree and a 10 degree delta T. It's important to understand that the spread of the adjacent zone can be contained by partitions and other obstructions, often resulting in longer spread in the opposite direction. On the other hand, the air pattern will simply pass around an object like a column, much like water in a stream.